Have you ever considered how much a relationship asks out of you? Is it requiring you to betray yourself? These are some of the questions we're going to deal with in today's podcast of Breaking Free from Narcissistic Abuse. Hi, I'm Dr. Carrie Kermakavoy, and I'm so excited to have you here with me. Be sure to subscribe so you don't miss future episodes, but let's dive into this episode. You know, I was thinking about, uh, I posted one of the new videos has to do with self-betrayal and how toxic people will ask us to choose the relationship or choose them over ourselves. Actually, both of the videos I posted today have to do that. And one of the comments came back with was, what is self-betrayal? And I thought we could talk about that today. The way that maybe the way that you're being asked to give up yourself in lieu of the relationship or in lieu of the other person the way that you make yourself smaller or you feel like you have to walk on eggshells. You know, one of the things I found was fascinating as I was listening, recently listening to Dr. Gibson, Dr. Lindsay Gibson about emotionally mature people versus emotionally immature people. And she says that she knows that she's sitting with someone who's in a, in a relationship with an emotionally immature person. When that person says all relationships are a lot of hard work. She said, I know then that I have somebody who's in a toxic relationship because relationships shouldn't be hard work. But I'd be curious to know how many of us know that. How many of us actually have an experience in which we're not working so hard, in which we feel like we have to be careful, watch what we say, don't ask for what we want. Hey, Tin, so good to see you. How many of us can feel like we This relationship makes us more versus makes us less. I find myself, I end up attracting people if I'm not careful, that I feel like I have to make myself smaller and smaller. I have to keep more of my opinions to myself. I can't speak up. I can't ask for what I need. Is that something that is happening to you as well? So let me pause for a second and tell you who I am, and then let's just jump into it. And Sarah, it's so good to see you today. I'm Dr. Carrie Kermakavoy. I'm a clinical psychologist. I have over 20 years of counseling experience. Currently these days, I mostly do um, content creation. I write and then talk about all issues related to narcissistic abuse. You know, I kind of backed into narcissistic abuse in a weird way. And I think that's how a lot of clinicians do it because it Fascinatingly, we don't get trained about narcissistic abuse in graduate training. Maybe uh, oh, I'm going to have to get used to you stalking me, huh, Sarah? I, I'm hoping that changes in graduate studies, but up to now, we are used to thinking about people individually. We don't tend to think people in the context of relationships. Yes, there is a theory called family systems theory, in which we look at organizations and systems, but we look at more uh, how they function versus uh, abuse, how abuse functions. I, it's hard to explain because the theory is so woo, kind of um, out there. It's kind of hard to understand. Um, but, but so this is new way for us is thinking, thinking about it and how I backed into it is I ended up, uh, my second marriage, my first marriage ended in death. My late husband passed away and then I jumped into another relationship and I ended up marrying, uh, a, a narcissistic sociopath. And at the time I didn't know it because they're very good at masking and hiding themselves, but it, it, it was just a disastrous experience. So as I got out of that, and here I am a a psychologist, and I love to understand the mind and how relationships work, I began to look into not only what I knew what narcissism was, I'd worked with it in the office, I also knew people personally in my own life who are narcissistic, but I hadn't really considered how it affects the relationship. What happens to people when we are in a relationship with somebody who's highly toxic or fragile or angry, or envious, or or somebody who needs the relationship to be all about them. That there's actually a way in which these relationships operate, which is why we why we connect so well with each other. And thank you so much, Lisa. I appreciate that. We connect because their similarities are amazing. How many times have you heard me say something and like, this is exactly what happened in my life? Or, you know, I play out a, a, a scenario and you can recognize it. Or the gaslighting is the same. Or the way the relationship ends is the same. It's because these relationships have a lot of commonality between each other each of them. And that's how I kind of backed into understanding it. Thank you so much, Tired. I appreciate that. You guys are really awesome. Oh, thank you so much. Um, So that's how we kind of 
I have stumbled into narcissistic abuse. I know that the field, I just went into a big seminar training this month with um, leading experts around the country. I know there's gaining attention with narcissistic abuse, but it is a real thing. So let me talk about, let's talk about what it is, how it makes you smaller, how you're healing. I would just love to kind of spend time with you today and talk about that. One of the things that I found fascinating, and I got to actually hear Dr. Romani speak in person this weekend or two weekends ago. She was at the Psychotherapy Networker Symposium. She was one of the keynote speakers who ended it and talked over lunch. It was a fascinating lunch, a fascinating lecture. But one of the things that she says is that all of us who've been caught in a narcissistic abusive relationship are in agony, that our experience is highly traumatizing, exper extremely distressing, and on top of it, we feel snared and trapped. Oh, Rebecca, so good to see you too. Yeah, feels like morning to me too. I'm one of those late starters. But a lot of, not all, I don't want to say all narcissists mean to be abusers, but interestingly enough, they tend to be abusive. Um, I don't think they tend to be offensive offenders, but they end up being offending us they because of their driving need they they end up um, ensnaring us in a in a relation they basically are we're I, I I struggle with the word supply I because it feels like it's so we're already objectified they're objectifying us but to be a supply feels like it's another, you know, it's, I don't know, it's so cold. I don't know how you feel hearing that word when you're a narcissistic supply. But on the, unfortunately, it does describe it. I, I've seen it more like, um, they, yeah, a good word. They tend to own us or they see us. I often think of it like we're food, you know. We're, we're something that we're a consumable. They, they use people as a consumable instead of seeing us as individuals, as people. In theory, they talk about this, particularly if you look at um, psychotherapy, psycho, I'm sorry, psychodynamic uh, analytic kind of therapy or object relations theory therapy, which is sort of really fascinating. They think of us as part objects, like you're not a you, you're an it. We talk about it as the I-it type of relationship instead of the I-you relationship, which is what we should we should be doing with each other. I see a lot of fascinating questions coming in, so I'm going to kind of start to talk about that. Yeah, properties is a good word, new power. I like that. Do I? Th yeah, and you know, peaceful living. Yes, they do. They use all people, all relationships as a consumable because you know when you have a hole deep and deep within you, something is completely missing. And you're utilizing relationships and people, particularly people, the relationship with others as a way to solve that unresolved need, the unmet need. Everybody becomes an accessory. Everybody becomes property or a consumable, even children. They don't, they don't, they don't conceptualize children as sacrifice something they're going to sacrifice to help grow. They view it as uh, what do they get? How does this person, this child reflect them? Which is what you're talking about, this peaceful living, this reflection. Is a child a good reflection of self for them? They perform well at school. Are they are they on the right teams? Do they have, are they on first string versus second? They see all this kind of, you know, do they behave right? I was listening to one of a, a, a new TikToker I had. I mean, she's not new. She's got a large audience, but I hadn't wasn't familiar with her. And she talked about how her parents controlled everything, like where things sat in the house and how you maybe used your toothpaste, you know, how you rolled it up. Why be so obsessive about that? That's because you're to present right. You're to be the good front. You're like, you're like the makeup they put on, you know, forward facing. They want all the image to be correct. So it ends up making everybody feels like they're not real. We're presenting an image. I know in my home, um, our, our people around our neighborhood thought we were amazing. We thought we were the perfect family. They didn't know that inside our family we were imploding, literally imploding. Um, we hit it well. I mean, we, I, in fact, people often use my sisters and I as examples of model students. And the common question would be is if one of us was going to an event, if that meant the event was kosher, that meant nothing bad was going to happen if one of us girl, because we were so good, you know. And how sad it was that they didn't know back at home how, how horrible it was and how what a rough position that we're in. So, yeah, um, 
So why do they get married? That's a fascinating question. Well, they get married because uh, that's what good people do. You know, if you're if you're image based person, you're going to make decisions that have good. Like for example, let's take my ex. My ex has been married now five times. Last I knew, he's engaged for the sixth. Why do this? If you blow it several times and you already see this track record of where you can't even sustain a relationship more than a few years, why do it over and over and over and over again? Well, because living for him, living with someone is inappropriate in the kind of culture he grew up in. That's not acceptable. You get married. You don't live with somebody. Now, I'm not saying that's right or wrong. I'm not making a judgment on should you or should you not. I'm saying for him, that's how he views success is people get married. You don't. So for him, he wants to get married, even though it fails over and over. To me, it's so costly, it cost him so much money every time he goes through a divorce. Although with me, it didn't it came out a winner on mine, but he most often doesn't. So why, why take that risk? But for him, the image means more than the risk, which is why he does it. I think there's, I think also there's a fantasy. I know that there's a fantasy. So when you have this, this hole within you that something's terribly wrong and you, you fear it's you, but you can't face it. That's what happens is they fear there's something defective with them, but it's so dangerous, so toxic that instead of facing that, they, they then solve it by rushing into relationships to, or accomplishments or work or whatever it is that they try to solve it. Um, you know, when you do that, you, you are, you, there's not self-reflection about the fact that this isn't working for them. And they have this fantasy. They build up of if I, this new person's going to be different. I'm going to, since it didn't work out the last time, I'll try it this way. And if maybe that will fix things, maybe they, so they see it as this ex outside them. The problem is outside them. It's the wrong person. That's why it didn't work. It'll be better the next time. And so they rush into the next relationship thinking somehow people are different that some, but we're not, you know, yes, we're different. We're all a unique fingerprint. We're all unique DNA, but the way relationships work isn't different. We all show up. We all need to be listened to. We all want to be loved. We all relationships take compromise. That part's consistent over, but they don't, they don't see that. They don't see that that's going to, it's going to play out the same. That's the fantasy. They have this idealized image of what it should be. They think it's the problem is the person. They get a new person thinking somehow they'll fix everything. And then of course it doesn't, it collapses again and again and again. And they do that, and it may be, I know some of them are doing it with intimacy issue, with, with intimacy, physical intimacy. They write their serial cheaters and they rush into the next person. And then, so it's a better looking person or a different kind of intimacy experience. And they do it again and do it again and do it again, thinking somehow this next one will, f will succeed when the last one failed and it never works. It's, it's literally, I mean, I, I, it's not the same, but it is a lot of the ways the same. It's like what the addict does with the next fix, thinking the next fix will be the experience. It will, it will be the, the ultimate experience. And they do, they do the same kind of fan, you know, fantastical thinking, the same kind of magical thinking. Yeah, they, they see themselves as owing the world and owing you nothing. Well, be, the reason they don't see you as owing nothing is because you don't actually exist. That's the, that's the hard part for us is we, we take all this personally. Doesn't he see how much he's hurting me? Doesn't she realize that I feel used for my accomplishments, my money or my car or whatever? Don't they see that uh, I have needs too? But no, the issue is that they actually, it's not that they're, yes, the, some of them do hurt you. I, the, those who are more sociopathic are going to be calculating and they want to get even and they get pleasure out of hurting you. Yes, that part is true. But not all of them are like that. Some of them, they just fail to see you. You just don't really exist. So if you don't really exist, then how can you be a something? You're not a something. You're a consumable. Do you worry about how the bread's feeling is? No, you just put on mustard and mayonnaise and it makes a good sandwich. You're not concerned about how its experience of that is. So that's why it feels like we're nothing. It's because we don't show up as a real, we're an it in their, their minds, not a you, not a person with needs. 
understand why bother understanding any all of this you know why what because it helps it helps you break yourself because you have a fantasy as well there's where we get into trouble is that we we they let's really be incredibly vulnerable for a few minutes and i'm going to use myself as an example when you come out of not a perfect situation at home and maybe you've not had a perfect relationship before Maybe you're a bit insecure, but you're not exactly at all sure how that insecurity plays out. You also have a fantasy, a wish. Mine was that I could fix people so they would choose me. There you go. There's my core issue. If I could somehow help you to be the best that you could be, then you could see me and then we'll have this really great relationship. So I get attracted to people who need help. You know, why are we surprised I got into psychology? It's, I was, you know, when you hear my family, you can hear that if I, that was the, the role they expected for me to play is that I would fix things. And they, the, all of us, my whole family has this fantasy is if I could fix things, then we would be healthy. And then if they're healthy, then they'd show up for me. That's my idealized wish. So when I meet somebody who's broken like this, I do feel the urge to want to rush in and change things for them thinking somehow we'll fix it. But you have the way you're doing it as well. They, they have, you know, one of the things that's kind of sad about all of this is that they're extremely, extremely savvy at picking up what you need and what your fantasy is and, and, and beginning to play it. So how mine did that with me, and I share this in my book called Love You More, is on our first day, he tells me that he's been abused. Now, how many guys do you guys know who would admit on their first date to sexual abuse? I don't know any. I've never met a guy who's done that ever. Siri on a first date? He's only known me two weeks. Who who gives this history at a first date? But see, he knew I was a psychologist and he knew he figured it would be very appealing to me to hear that. That it would create this, it would activate, he's hoping. Now, is he consciously aware of this? No, no, it's not conscious. But at an unconscious level, there was a desire to activate the wish for me to sort of fix him, solve him, heal him. It, so you, that's your shadow. You have a shadow side of you as well. Maybe it is you want to be a, the perfect nurturer. Maybe you want to be seen as the most beautiful woman or the most lovely man in the world. I, there's a way in which you got activated. Your need to be seen in this idealized way got activated. Yeah, for me, it was like, oh, how, you know, how precious. And, and it, you know, made me feel like I wanted to rush in and do something about it. So by us understanding all these dynamics, when you start to feel that feeling again, so now when I feel hear someone's rough story, I like, wait a minute, you're not their therapist, you're not their mother, and it's their job, they're grown ups, they can fix themselves, you don't need to do this, and your issue is back there, you can't fix the past, it's already gone, it's done, you're here today, and this isn't good for you to play this back out over and over and over again. So that's how it helps to know this is it gives us the insight, gives us some tools so that we can recognize the longing because, you know, healthiness is, is not getting, this is another big fallacy I, I know people have about therapy. Being healthy doesn't mean this, you won't feel it again. Yeah, maybe with time, lots and lots of time you won't. Getting healthy means that you don't, you aren't at the same risk of acting out again. You'll still feel the urge. It's not going to go away. But maybe the next time you won't be so vulnerable to falling for it. You can reckon, oh, there's that urge. Oh, that doesn't work out for me. I'm not going to enter into that relationship like that because I remember how it went the last time. And so then you do something different. Okay, I've been on a long kind of talk here. So let me pause and catch up to see what you guys are going to say. I probably can't deal with everything, but I, I'm going to attempt to sort of see the big issues in here. There's 48 messages packed up, so I want to. And by the way, I appreciate so much for you guys sharing this and, and the likes. It's been fantastic and all of that. And, and one of the things I want to make you aware of is there's a seminar coming up on April 6th. 7 p.m. It's about um, how to overcome and recognize narcissistic abuse. If you like what I'm having to say and you find it really interesting, this is exactly the seminar you're going to want to be at. There's going to be two therapists, two coaches, and two self-aware narcissists, and we're going to get into the mind of the narcissistic and narcissistic abuse. So if this is helpful to you, that's an evening to hear even a broader perspective across a whole panel, and actually you get to participate. It's not just we teach, 
or share. We're going to actually take questions. So it's going to be an incredible evening. You can see the link in my bio to get your tickets, $20. If you can't go that night, the great thing is you get a free access to a replay. It's going to be amazing. I, I'm so excited about this lineup, guys. This is an amazing lineup. It really is. I think I'm the smallest account, to be honest with you, on it. Uh, they, yeah, so it's a huge account. Um, it's going to be just a really incredible time, something you don't want to miss. Okay, so let me kind of catch up. And I always hate how it drops all of them in, and I have to go back. So, yeah, so Peaceful Living saying, my child's gone, no contact. The nurse's parent is free, and free, freaking out. Yeah, it's because they can't control. <clears throat> Narcissism and all sorts of toxic, the cluster B, they're all about power, domination, and control. That's how they manage their insecurity or their fear, fear of something going wrong, is they, they want these three things. If you, say, for example, uh, Say some, Say that you know that everybody in your life is a terrible driver. I mean, like scary, terrible, like like going to hit somebody or hit something. When you get in a car, you're going to let them drive? No, you're going to drive, right? Because that's the only way you can keep yourself safe. Now, that's how they view the world. They need to keep themselves safe. The way to keep themselves safe is to maintain control. But yes, some of them want control because they like control over you. But I'm saying in a more general, kinder way, that's kind of what's happening is they're managing their own risk, but they're also managing you gives them pleasure. That's their piece. Not all of them, not for all of them, but for some of them, that's true. Uh, yeah, it is a facade, definitely. Okay, I'm going to go back because I'm now 50 some behind. Okay, um... Oh, Ms. Mew, the reason you're missing the time is because I never start on time. I, I you know, I, I start within the hour. So if it says noon, it starts in the noon hour. Unless I'm being interviewed or interviewing someone, those are I'm, I'm, I'm punctual for. But I'm not punctual for the rest because life happens, you know. So it's hard to, I try to do these so frequently that I just try to be kind to myself by doing it when I can get here. So today I got here about like 1240, which is why you missed it. So I'm part, part, appreci uh, sorry about that. Um, yeah, they, the victimhood, you know, victimhood is a very powerful thing for the covert narcissist. You guys want to talk about covert narcissist? I've been doing a lot of, th today's been, they've been the topic and there's a group that I'm a part of and we've been talking and today covert narcissism popped up. What is, because somebody, po this is why, because someone posted a TikTok on it and they were, they misunderstood it. They diagnosed, they described it wrong. They just, yeah, really wrong actually. They just actually described a typical narcissist. They didn't describe covert narcissists. And the reason is because covert narcissists are so hard to recognize. They present completely differently. So as a result, it's, I've been in a relationship with a couple, so and then I have also seen them. I know who you know how they present. It's just a very, very different thing. So we can talk about that if you're interested. Let me know if that's something you want to talk about. But let me kind of catch back up. Um Yeah. Yeah, it's interesting you guys are throwing out various theories about why they get married. Yeah, the, I, the value of the identity over actual values, that's true. That's a good point to put. Yeah, right. Le look at like leave, or, leave it to beaver. It, yeah, it, it is a selfish mentality. I do agree that, and sorry, when I hit some of these, sometimes your name pops up, you guys, and if so you see me just, you know, at somebody, it's because I accidentally hit your name and it wants to send a message out. Um, I don't know if anybody, by the way, I, um, I, yeah, I don't know. Did anybody address um, uh, Viking, Viking witch Jew? Is the first of all, that's a very that's kind of a unusual name, guys. Yeah, we also don't smear each other here. That this is a behavior. This is a place where we need to be safe. And one of the things that we are safe is that we don't talk about my, about my appearance. We don't talk about politics, and we don't talk about religion, in order to maintain the safety of the room. So, if that's something that um, isn't main, being maintained then I, I do ask that you are muted as a result of that. And yes, I am, a, I am a therapist. I don't currently do counseling. I stopped counseling when my husband passed away. I just wasn't in shape to do it anymore. So um, it, it takes a lot out of me. It's, not, I'm, it's just not the way that I'm wired. I do much better educating in writing is a much more way that for me to operate. 
are you fixable? Of course, everyone is, you know, what does fixable mean? Can you feel more safe in yourself? I'm talking to Aisha Rose. Can you feel more safe being who you are and, and, and kind of learning to embrace yourself? Absolutely. That is very possible. Absolutely. If anybody, just this is a general statement because I'm seeing this come up. Anybody who wants help with coaching or counseling or you want some online support group help, whether uh, any of that, I can point you in the direction of that. Please feel free to get a hold of me. You can DM me on my Instagram account called Psychology. I'm sorry, I changed my name. It's Carrie McAvoy, PhD. You, it's the same handle as here. So you put the same you know handle that you have here. And the link in the bio, my bio, will take you over at Instagram. And you can message me and then I will send you a, a links of those that I know who are taking clients who are who are narcissistic abuse aware. So if you're looking for good help and it's going to be online because of the way things work and a lot of it won't take insurance, not everybody, especially if you guys are not in the same state or even the same country, it'll have to be private pay. But if you want some direction on that, and I also know some fantastic groups, particularly I just, I saw Darla's comment of you was living with someone with a secret sexual life or secret life. I don't know that. I know that one. Uh, I know several really wonderful betrayal trauma groups that you can be a part of, but just fantastic. I've met the best, the best people in these groups. So supportive. So DM me if you want some help with that for sure. Yeah, I am so sorry about that, that that happened to you. And, um, oh, I'm, I'm glad Ms. Miura, you picked up Lindsay Gibson's book. It's the Lindsay Gibson book that, you know, I love, I love books. I think books are so, so fast, fast, fantastic. So let me pause and go through some books that I think you guys can't miss that are really, really awesome. Um, one of them is, um, this is by, this, remember the panel I'm telling you about that's so awesome? Well, Manjeet, Rip, Rip, I don't ever say her name right, uh, Rupai, Manjeet is going to be on that panel. She has a book called a, a Survival Guide to Toxic Relationships and Nar Toxic Narcissistic Relationships. This is Ru Manjeet. She's, you'll find her. She's on TikTok. She has a fantastic channel, you know, excellent content. She's also on YouTube. Then another one that's going to be on that panel is is Lisa Sony's work. She has the uh, Trauma Bond Recovery Program. She also then has a self-love uh, reflection, which is more of like helping you recover. Amazing content. If you're looking for a journal to kind of help you um, get out of the relationship and make peace with it. Then um, my book is Love You More. This is a description of a narcissistic abusive relationship, what actually happens. It's told like a more like kind of a true crime-like story. So if you want to see how it can hap happen to anyone, including a psychologist, this is a book that like, reads like a novel, but gives you an inside look of what happens behind the scene. The book that we're referring to that lately has, is Lindsay Gibson's book, Adult Children of Emotionally Immature Parents. This, however, applies not only to immature parents, but also immature relationships. She's got a follow-up book as well. It has a more recovery book, so there's two of these. Um, another fantastic one that I have been just absorbing, just absorbing, is, and it came out in November, it's called Why Can't I Just Leave by Kristen Milstead. Kristen, Kristen Milstead. She talks about cognitive dissonance, what happens that leaves us confused, why we get stuck, why it's so hard to leave, and, and breaks it down for you so you can understand. What happened to her is a lot of what happened to me. It's very it's eerie how the similarities, and we're both psychologists and it happened to us. If you have a mom who's toxic or a narcissist, there's two books that I highly recommend, actually maybe three. One is called The Emotionally Absent Mother. It's by, the name is um, by J Jasmine Corey, Jasmine Corey, and then Mothers Who Can't Love. Susan Forward stuff is all fantastic. You'll see I quote her a lot in Instagram, Mothers Who Can't Love. She She's an expert, or a frequent writer on narcissistic abuse. Then for the stuff on sociopaths, and I don't know if I have them both out here, one is called Psychopath, or Socio Psychopath Free, um, and I'm trying to find the one, oh, it, yeah, it's the first ver the first of his books called Psychopath Free. I don't have it out here, but then he wrote the second one is Whole Again. This is his name is Jackson McKenzie. Jackson McKenzie. Amazing, amazing author on the material on that. 
And what else? Do I have anything else over here that's really good? Let's see. Oh, and here's another one I'm currently reading at the moment, How He Gets Into Her Head by Don Hennessy. Don Hennessy is part of an Irish task force looking at domestic abuse, and he breaks down the steps to grooming, how they groom, they meet, they prepare you, groom you, then offend. It's fascinating. And he's the one that I quoted, and I really, really love this. Is he says, anybody who wants to get really proud and arrogant by that they've not gotten a toxic relationship is because they've not met a skilled enough offender. That um, one of the things that we're discovering is that it isn't that you're codependent and that you have a troubled childhood or you're an insecure person. This is why you got into a toxic relationship. No, you met somebody who's very, very skilled at manipulation, so skilled that you are actually being brainwashed. Truly, truly, either use cult programming tactics to get you to be suggestible and break down your, your normal defenses and it also grooms you to be um, very, uh, to trust them rapidly and to, and they begin to kind of mentally get into your head and change your worldview into their worldview, which makes you then amenable to them utilizing, you know, you as supply, which is, is that's horrible. It's horrible. So those are right now some of my top books. There are really lots of really great books, but those are some top books that I really recommend. Oh, thank you. I'm so glad, Rebecca, that my book has helped you. You know, it's it's interesting because mine's not self-help. Mine's more a story of what happened. But it, the point I wanted you to know is, one, you're not alone. If it happens to me, it can happen to anybody. Not to say that I'm all that, but, you know, I've been trained to understand the mind. You'd think that that training would have given me more protection against this type of uh, this type of tactics, but it doesn't. You know, if we're not aware and not on the lookout, we don't, you know, if you don't view the, and this is, I hate that we're even talking this way because I don't want us to view the world this way, but there are people who are actually evil. And uh, I mean, in the sense that they don't mean you well, they're not well-intended people. And if you, we don't go into the world looking for non-well-intended people, people who are bad intended, then we're going to be, miss the fact that they're, they're toxic, dangerous individuals. And I didn't, when I got into dating, I didn't view it that way. I mean, I'd not dated since I was 19 and I'm in my fifties and, you know, so that's the point of my book is I wanted you to actually see the subtlety, what happens, how it happens. You can even see the stages, you know, the love bombing, and then you can see the disillusionment happening, the discard starts, you can feel it being set up. And so the point is, so you can sort of see the confusion, the mental confusion I had. One of the things I'm working on and I'm super excited about, you guys, is that I'm developing a course on cognitive dissonance. What is that? It is the tension you feel when you're faced with decisions. We all have it. It happens everywhere. Like today, you know, what do I want for lunch? Should I have that cookie for lunch or should I eat oatmeal or a sandwich or something more healthy? In that moment, you're faced with a competing values, competing goals, and you have a little moment of distress. And then you work through it by you making a decision. You either explain away the not great decision by justifying it, or you choose the good behavior and say, yeah, you know, and you move on. That's how we go through cognitive dissonance. What happens with these toxic relationships is it creates cognitive dissonance the moment you meet them, and it never is resolved. It just changes from one thing to the next thing to the next thing. And you start to feel increasingly like you're at, at, at threat, like something's terribly wrong, either with you or with this person or with the relationship. And you just feel this sense of like you can't relax and you're on guard and you're, the confusion grows and you're just, you feel trapped. And you, so that's, that's cognitive dissonance. The, part, the horrible part about all of this is this is what I find super shocking. They haven't really done research on chronic cognitive dissonance. We don't know what happens to the person, except that we're seeing brain changes. So when you're in that state for a long term, you actually, your, your arousal area, the area of you that's protective, it's really deep in the brain called the amygdala, it swells. It gets larger because you're under threat. You feel threatened all the time. So you start to get more and more on alert. That's why sleep becomes a problem. It's often you'll struggle with your weight or you'll have GI issues. You, you have all the things that normally we get into a fight or flight mode. All those things go into a chronic. They're chronically up chronically in an alarm, in a state of alert. 
and that has incredible repercussions for the body. It's not the body's not meant to stay in this this position for a long time. And then the part called the hippocampus is where you store memories and some of the emotions are at. That part shrinks. And have you noticed you're struggling to make decisions and you feel confused and you forget things and things that used to be easy for you are not coming so easy to you? That's why. And then your prefrontal cortex, which is where you make decisions and you have good judgment and you have insight, also doesn't do well. And you start to show damage there as well. And so that's what happens with chronic cognitive dissonance. But here's the thing. We've not looked at this. We don't, and we don't really have good solutions out to help people break it. And it's what traps us because we can't figure out what's wrong. Is it me? Is it him or her? Is it the relationship? Is it there? And then we come back to, it must be me. What's wrong with me? Or maybe I'm weak or we do all these really, really weird things. So I'm working on a course and if I'm right now looking for beta participants. So if you would like to go through it for free, instead of, I think I'm not for sure how much I'm going to charge to for it yet, but I think it's going to take about maybe five plus hours to work through. And what you would give me back and Lou for you doing it is feedback on what you thought, what works, what didn't work, you know, um, how it changed things for you, what kind of, if you're willing to do that for me, then I would be happy to add you as a, a beta participant. I have a few more people, slots for people. I would love, again, DM me over on my Instagram account, psycho, or Carrie McAvoy PhD. And then uh, let me know that you'd like, and I'll add you. It's probably maybe another month or so before I'll be ready to do that. But just let me know that you're interested, and I'd be happy to add you. That would be really, really wonderful. Um, does someone ask, Jenny wants to know, does abuse escalate? Yes, abuse after events. Yes, the reason it does, it's because these events, like you mentioned marriage and children, when you're, let's go back to this person who's really shaky core and they, they have this, they're not, they're not, they're kind of rooted in shame. And when, you, and they're, so love bombing is all about the making the sale. You know, they're very good at making the sale. But once they close the sale, like you get married or you have a child, then they start to drop all that effort because that's not who really they are. They were trying to make the sale because they want you to choose them and love them and give you all the, give them all the adoration and attention. So once they know it's kind of like locked in, they start to drop the things that they were doing in order to get you to do that. But they don't do it little. They don't do it all at once. They usually let it like little by little. It slot drops more and more and more. Um, Sinful just put up a video. I don't know if it was today, but recently where she showed in the beginning, they give you this big, big, beautiful gift of like bread. And then by the end, they're giving you just a crumb and they're leaving you with that. So it's like that. It's an incremental withdrawal of what they used. But here's the part that caused the cognitive dissonance. We bought the person we met, we thought is the real person. So that really generous, loving, whatever the person you meet, you think that's who they are. And so it makes you work harder to get that person back. Then you think then you must have done something wrong or things going wrong. Or for me, I kept thinking, well, we're under stress. It's because we're going to get ready to move internationally. It's because we're starting a new business. That's why he's not the way he should be. I kept like explaining away the bad behavior for for, you know, instead of realizing, no, I never met the real person. The reason it's worse is because this is who he truly is. It's not that, but you don't know that. How do we know that, right? So that's why, Jenny, that's why that happens that way. Okay. All right. There is a lot of interest in talking about covert narcissism. Um, Oh, thank you so much, Bree. I appreciate that. Yeah, why why can't I just leave? Does have that 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 does have a cover of a bird in a cage. It is. It does make you want to feel like you want to break free. It does. Oh, that's a great suggestion for me. The one reason I struggle with moving these over to YouTube is because of this. The chat part's not there, so people can't see it. But you're right. I could take this and break it into pieces and put the pieces up and then, you know, get rid of the, get rid of the, um, the dialogue like this. So let's talk about covert narcissism. Um, there's a lot we don't understand about it. So I'm going to tell you what I've heard different ex people I consider experts talk about it and then try to piece together some of my thoughts about it. Cause I'll tell you, this is not covered in grad school. It's not so, and there's not very little theoretical research on it or theoretical work on it. So it's based on what 
those of us who've been in the field working with it, trying to piece together what we know about narcissism in general, and then how to describe how what happens. So this is the thought on it, okay? Covert narcissists are believed to be narcissists who t- wanted to be an overt narcissist and that failed. So what do I mean by that? Overt narcissists, if you know, are bigger than life. And they often, interestingly enough, guys, overt narcissists tend to succeed. They tend to gain money, gain wealth and gave intention. They tend to do what you think, you know, think about who's been president. How did that happen? Right. Or how many CEOs do we know that we probably would not want to meet in real life because they're not that nice of people, but they're big and they think big and they push people hard and they're not easy to work for and they expect perfection and they tend to do well. But not all of them. Some of them don't do well. Some of them in, ends in disaster or failure, repeated disaster and failure. That's for the covert. What happens for the covert? It fails over and over. It doesn't work. So instead of them pursuing the grandiosity, the, oh, I can do anything mode, they flip it. They flip the, the narrative and move into, I'm the perfect victim. My life, my life is never good. Uh, it always goes wrong. So they find they become hyper aware or hyper focused on, on the the bad part, the victimhood, and then they begin to manipulate around that. See me because it never works out for me, or see me because I have this chronic problem or issue or whatever it is, and and then they begin to and it becomes very the tactics become very um, subtle, insidious. Very hard, and because they're very good at. Here's the other misunderstanding: we say narcissists don't have empathy. Yeah, they actually do have empathy, but the way they utilize it is different. They don't utilize it as a way to understand you, because remember, you're not a you; you're an it. So they don't really care about what how happens, but they use it as a way to enlist, to solicit you, to enlist you. So I can care about your life and to the degree that you then get invested so that you see me. And then the minute you see me, I no longer care. That's what happens. So, so a, t- a classic tactic of a covert would be to say, how are you doing? And the reason they ask is because they want you to then say, I'm okay or whatever. So then you go, well, how are you? Oh, bam, there we go. Now we're into not good. It's not going great over here. And then they launch into whatever the new disaster is in their life. And they'll hold the floor, just like the overt narcissist will hold the floor over, like, you know, look, the best project, and it worked out like this, and this is, I mean, aren't I all that? Instead, they'll hold the floor around what's going wrong. So they use it in the, it's it's the inverse of the overt narcissist is the covert narcissist, the inverse. They hold the floor around their victimhood. They manipulate around their victimhood. You go and have a really great time. You go out with your friends. You have a good evening. You haven't called much. Why didn't you call? You Did you forget about them? Who, who would do that? Because they're having such a rough time. Only it never goes well and they're never better. And they never, you know, so they're the perpetual forever perfect victim. Or I heard one of somebody I knew once, they took a trip and they this person called back to the, the covert narcissist, how are you not good, must be nice to be you and be able to go out. I mean, you always like this sob story on everything. You feel like, like breaking out the violin for them is how it feels. So, but they get, they, they express the anger and they're very controlling too, but they do it in passive aggressive ways. So instead of the you know, they gaslight you around that, around the victimhoodness. That's what makes it so hard to see. It's it's not this, I'm special because I'm special. It's I'm special because I'm a victim, because things go wrong for me, which we don't, we're not geared to hear it, you know, and we do feel bad. A lot of times these people, these people really have things that are not easy to deal with, that feel really toxic or hurtful or hard. And so I've known several who've had chronic illnesses, and then they use the chronic illness for chronic attention. But here's how, so how do you spot them? Because there are people who are legitimately having things go wrong, and they do, and when you're being traumatized, you do need a lot of care. So how do you, how do you know when it's being manipulative versus when it's actually legitimate? Couple things. One is that watch for the attention. Are they able to share the floor with you? Covert narcissists won't. They, I literally had a phone call with one. This somebody was kind of interested in me, got a hold of me. I got on the phone call, and he spent like an hour talking to me. And then finally, he said, "So how are you doing?" And I'm thinking, "Oh, okay. Now I get my hour to talk about what's going." I said, "Oh, not good." And I started it. He interrupted 
and then one-upped me with a worse story and took the floor back. You see that kind of dynamic that tells you you're dealing with someone very toxic. See, there's no reciprocity. Just like with an overt narcissist, there's no reciprocity. There's no reciprocity with a covert as well. So the behaviors are the same, but the way they express the behavior is different. Does that make sense? Neither narcissist will share the floor with you. Neither narcissist will relinquish control to you. Neither narcissists have a lot of empathy about what's happening in your life, but how they do it is unique to the style of narcissism. The covert narcissist will do it around what's wrong. The overt narcissist will do it about what's going grand. Like uh, I, my, my ex is a covert narcissist and he would say, look what the special shirt people bought me when I left, when I left the job. And I say, yeah, well, I had a hard time. People weren't, didn't really notice. I had to close a practice so people weren't all that, oh, then we're back on to, isn't that great how they did this for me? And again, I already heard this how many times? Why are you trotting out the shirt to show me again? Well, because you want to rub it in how special you are. Where Overt would say more like, can you believe they didn't give me, I left that job and I gave my best and that's all I got for it. And then they, you tried to share how it happened to you and then they'd flip it back to, but theirs was worse or way more or you don't, I mean, it would be, <laughs> it's the same, it's the same tactic. They still hold the floor. It just gets expressed differently. So how, watch for that. Watch for the similarities of the structure, but ignore the fact that the way it's expressed is different. Their, their manipulation is still going to be gaslighting. Like you don't understand me. I forget that you're just, you're not sensitive to what goes on. See, it's still gaslighting, but it'll be, it'll be gaslighting around you failing to be perfect for them. Whereas the other one is more of like gaslighting. Like, why are you bothering them with them with the way that they fail to show up for you? So it, but they're still gaslighting. They'll be more passive aggressive and passive aggressive is very hard to call out, extremely hard. Um, that's why they use it is because you can't really like, you're late. You Can you get your shoes on faster? Oh, you're pushing me. You know my back hurts and it's just hard. You know that. Well, you knew we were going to leave at one. So why are you putting your shoes on at one? Because I I've been in so much pain all morning. I mean, it's like that. Now, it's one thing if it's a recent injury, but if it's they set you up consistently to make you late, oh, we're, and then you can't call them on it because it's so like, you know, you feel cruel for doing it. See, this, see that's why it's so subtle. I mean, because there's legitimate forms to this, but they, they use it as a way to manipulate you and to express their anger at you or their envy of you, so which is really, really hard. So watch for that. Huh. How I recognize it is how they make me feel. When I know that I'm being asked a question so that it's set up so that they can get the attention, that I, I know that I've probably met a covert narcissist. I had somebody who, was, who really was invested. I had two surgeries this last year, and somebody kept saying, how are you doing? How are you doing? And I, I know he was trying to be nice, but really was so that I would ask him how he was doing. And then he was like, not good. It's always not good. I mean, it's the same story over and over and over. Um, so I just stopped answering how I was doing. I just knew it was a setup for him to get the floor. So that's how you kind of know is you're like, oh, goodness, here we go again. Um, but it's hard. They're very hard to identify. And I don't know if I did a good job explaining because it's so, so subtle. Um, I let's stay on for about five more minutes and then I'll wrap it up. Can I, okay, somebody asked a, a question of Muddy wanted to know, how do you know, how do you know the difference between, um, sorry, it's, oh, I hate that. How do you know the difference between toxic people and narcissists? I, I often use toxic people because not everybody's a narcissist. There, you have sociopaths, psychopaths, you've got the people who are on a borderline. And by the way, we're on the continuum of all of this. We all have the capacity to be ruthless sometimes. We all have the capacity to want to feel special, need to be special. We all need, and we're all fear abandonment, which is what the borderline's fearing. So we're somewhere on the continuum. Hopefully we're not toxic enough. We're hurting people. That, to me, I guess that's the big difference is can you reflect on your behavior? Do you recognize the way that you're affecting other people? Do you consider other people's needs in addition to your own? The, the degree that you, do you have an ability to sort of resist being hurtful to people? Do you have an ability to sort of reflect on what you say before you say it so it's not harmful? That, to me, differentiates toxicity versus non-toxicity. 
people, those of us who have control, we all sometimes want to do, you know, spar off at something, call somebody a bad name, but do you, can you stop yourself? Do you have control over that? That to me helps define the degree of healthy you are. The more you are, you know, what they'll say is I can't help myself. Yeah, you can. Everybody can help ourselves. It takes practice. It's not easy. Yeah, it's, it's a lot of, a lot of self-control, but we all have self-control. We all are given that ability. Um, but it feels so int- I know it feels intense. It feels intense for me too. It's intense for all of us. But the ability to learn what else to do is what differentiates people who are healthy from those who are toxic. But I use tox- toxic as a word just because it, I want to kind of generalize the big group. It's better to me than saying cluster B or ant. The new word in the field of psychology is antagonistic. They refer to this group as not cluster B. They refer to them as antagonistic. They're the opposite of agreeable. They're antagonistic. That's how they're kind of conceptualizing them these, these days. Oh, you're so, I appreciate you, Rebecca. Thank you so much. It does take a lot of work, D. It takes a tremendous amount of work help to become self-aware. It is this muscle. You have to practice it. All of this is muscles that you can practice. You can get better at being self-reflective. You can get better. So how do you do that? So you come away, you have a conversation. This is how you, I can tell you how to learn how to do this. You have a conversation, you step away, and you say, how did that go? Did I feel the other person was heard? Did they act like they were heard? Did what I say help or make things worse? How much did I control the floor and why? What was driving my need to control the floor? Now, it's going to sometimes be out of balance. There will be times you'll show up and somebody's really in trouble and you're going to really give them the attention they need. That's normal. There's going to be times that you show up and you're not doing well and you're going to take the floor most of the time. But is it? are you able to share the floor ever? Is it, some, is it this normal? It should be this normal back and forth. So by stepping away and reflecting, now I want to say something because some of us in this group, you may struggle with OCD or you're very, very hard on yourself or extremely self-conscious. You got to be aware of that. You got to be aware of nobody does anything perfectly. We all say things that are, I mean, I'm very, that's how I am. I'm more bent like, oh, I'm not, you guys say, put this on YouTube. I'm like, "Eh, this is not a perfect session and I don't feel, you know, that's how I work is I feel I'm very hyper aware. I hate looking at myself and I, you, I don't have mirrors in my house because I don't like looking at myself. And yeah, I have to sit and stare at myself for wh- however long I'm here. It's very, very uncomfortable for me. But so I'm pushing through it, pushing through it. So be aware of that bend. I have to say to myself, well, when you listen to other people on YouTube, they don't say things perfectly. They make errors. You know, it's okay. Everybody makes errors. You're still making a good point, a point that's helpful. So that's what I'm saying. You you take away, you take your bent, you step away, and you process it in a realistic way. And then by doing that, you become more self-aware, and then you can get stronger in these these muscles. Last night, I'll tell you, I so badly, usually Friday nights as I hang out with um, my my adult sons, we enjoy adult beverage, and then... Uh, and we have a dinner t- together and we enjoy a movie. Well, I wanted a second and third. Like, no. I said to myself, no, you don't need it. It's not going to help anything. You just don't need it. And they're like, yep, I really want it. No, you don't need it. And uh, you know what? I didn't. So that's how you, that's how you get through it. You you become, you practice, you work at this, you work at this. And you, you know, it's not that you don't have these urges, these desires, these needs, these any of it. It's not that you think perfectly and behave. It's that you, 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 you rein yourself in. You know how like a horse has a bit in its mouth and, and it directs where it's going. You direct your actions. You direct your life. The more you direct it, the the more healthier you are. The healthier you are. Oh, you guys are so sweet. So I'm here. Let me add a couple pieces of business just before wrap up please join the seminar it's gonna be an amazing night amazing night you enjoy hanging out with me like this you're gonna love that night so please join us april 6 7 p.m link in the bio the other thing is i go live three times a week here and i go live on instagram on wednesdays so uh so tuesdays thursdays and saturdays when i go live around around noonish not at lunch i don't do it right at noon in the noon hour um, I'm sorry. And I don't, I just don't want to hold myself to that. But in that hour, I say, I'm going to come on is when I come on. I'd love you guys to check out my book. Love you more. It's really, um, you know, and let me know what you think. 
And if you're interested in being a beta participant for the Cognitive Dissonance course, please get a hold of me, DM me. And if you have any struggles like finding good coaching, good groups, good therapists, DM me about that and I can make a referral for you. Bye-bye.